Well, hey, good morning, friends. So good to have you with us today. If you're joining us online, welcome. My name's Ryan. If we haven't had the chance to meet yet, I'm one of the pastors here and just really grateful to open the scriptures with you today. I want to start by giving you two pictures to hold in your mind. In early 2000, there was an American energy company based in Houston, Texas, that was considered one of the largest and most successful companies in the world. Anybody know what their name was? Enron. Enron. Yeah, a few of you have heard of them. I hope you don't have money invested in them. Yeah, we haven't heard about Enron because they were a success story, but rather because Enron cooked their books, came up with a complex Ponzi scheme in order to inflate their profits and hide their debts. And in adding insult to injury, a number of their executives and their executives' friends pulled money out of Enron shortly before the bottom fell out of Enron and left everybody else holding the bag. Uh, Investors lost, one news station said they lost $74 billion dollars in the whole Enron fiasco. That's picture number one. Picture number two, October 5th, 2017, the news about famous Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein broke. It was first, first reported by a couple of reporters from the New York Times, and then it was discovered that um, over 80 women came forward and said that they had been taken advantage of by Weinstein. It shaped the cultural landscape that we still live in today. It launched what's become known as the Me Too movement, where 2.3 million people have hashtag Me Too'd in order to say, yeah, I've been taken advantage of also. Two pictures that I think embody 19th century British politician Lord Acton's quip, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts corrupts absolutely. And as we look through the annals of history, I think we see this truth played out over and over again. And inside the church, unfortunately, is no different. We live in a cultural moment where people are, I think rightfully so, a bit skeptical of those in positions of of authority. And yet there's something in all of us, I think, that rises up. And when somebody gets taken advantage of or loses their money um, uh, because of no fault of their own, there's something in us that rises up and says, this, this ought not be. Or at least when we get taken advantage of or those that we love get taken advantage of, some, but something in us rises up and says, this ought not be. And did you know that Jesus agrees with that sentiment? That Jesus agrees with that feeling of, of angst. And and sometimes, sometimes it takes dramatic action to catalyze drastic change to systems of power. And that's exactly what we are going to see in John chapter 2. So if you have your Bible, would you open there with me? John chapter 2. We studied the first half of this great chapter together last week, and we saw Jesus. uh, uh, I call Jesus in the first part of John 2, party Jesus. He turns water into wine, and he's everybody's favorite person. In the second half of John chapter 2, Jesus is not going to be quite as popular. And what I'd like to do is give us a picture of what's going on, and I'll read verses 13 to 17, so you get the scene in your mind, and then we'll go back and tackle some of the details. Sound good? Here we go. John chapter 2, starting in verse 13, says this. And the Passover of the Jews was at hand. Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. Making a whip of cords, he drove them out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and he overturned their tables. And he told those who sold pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. This is um, one one of the scenes of Jesus. I think when we we talk about Jesus' personality and character in its totality, I think this needs to rise to the surface because uh, the picture that we often have, rightfully so, of Jesus is of humble, gentle, meek, and mild Jesus. 
And there was another side to Jesus. Uh, Last week, we saw uh, the side of Jesus that sort of, um, I called it earlier, party Jesus. He's life of the party. Here we see activist Jesus. At the wedding, Jesus solves a problem. At the temple, Jesus creates a massive problem. And unlike the event that we looked at last week, in the very first part of John chapter 2, when Jesus turns water into wine, John is the only one who records that event. The other gospel writers do not. But all four gospels have a story about Jesus cleansing the temple in them. But once again, John is unique. John is unique. Instead of putting this story at the beginning of Jesus' last life, or last week of his life on earth, as he goes to the cross... He puts it at the very beginning of the gospel. And people have wondered, were there actually two temple cleansings? Like maybe one at the beginning of Jesus' ministry and one at the end. That's certainly a possibility. There's some good scholars that would go that direction. Um, My personal conviction is I, I think there's probably only one temple cleansing. And I think it happened towards the end of Jesus' life where the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, or Matthew, Mark, and Luke put it. Because John doesn't record a second temple cleansing. If there'd been a second temple cleansing, I think John would have put it right there. So why does John move it to the beginning? Why why does John use this story in order to help frame the rest of his gospel? I think John is telling us in a poetic way that everything Jesus does from this point forward is turning over the tables. Everything Jesus does from this point forward is in the stream of his angst against religious corruption going, this ought not be. See, we're told from the very beginning when this happens. John doesn't mince words about that, and he doesn't try to pretend that it didn't happen when the Synoptic Gospels put it as happening. He says, the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up um, in elevation to Jerusalem. He went up to Jerusalem. So when did Jesus tip over the tables? What was going on? Passover, right. And so you just have to imagine that during Passover, there was uh, roughly a million Jews that descended upon Jerusalem. Oftentimes, they came from miles and miles away. They would come to Jerusalem in order to worship. They came to Jerusalem full of excitement, full of religious fervor, um, uh, wanting to participate in all that it meant to come and to celebrate the Passover. And what did it mean to celebrate the Passover? It was to remember that God himself had freed the Israelite people from slavery in Egypt. And so when John tells us it happened at the Passover, he wants us to see two things happening. Number one, he timestamps it for us. But number two, there's this biting irony to the fact that they are celebrating liberation and then participating in a system at the temple that's enslaving them in a different way once again. And it's that system that Jesus confronts. It's that system that Jesus addresses. This is a prophetic protest against corrupt religion because Jesus hates corrupt religion. And Passover freedom was being replaced with religious corruption, and Jesus confronts that religious corruption in order to lead people to a new Passover, a new exodus kind of freedom. Now, I think it's worth just pausing to acknowledge that as human beings and sinful human beings— We have a way of twisting God's good things, the things that he creates, and using them to hurt people that God loves. Like, this is not, this is not beyond us. This is a, this is not a how could they. And I think I just want to step back from this text in general to say, let's do our best not to read this in a how could they way. I think it's best if we read this in a way that where we allow it to read us. And so my prayer has been that we would walk out of this place today going, ouch, that helps. Ouch. That hits a little too close to home, but it, it, it helps. And maybe we could just say that together so that we're all on the same page. Ouch, that helps on three. One, two, three. Yeah, and my hope is that it will help because the system that God created and designed was not bad, but the way that people abused it was. 
And we see that happening with food, and we see that happening with money, and we see that happening, happening with sexuality, and we see that happening in religion. And I think this text begs us to ask the question, God, what tables might you want to overturn in our church? And maybe first, what tables might you want to overturn in me? Are you willing to ask that question today? If you are, let's continue in verse 14. It says this, In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons. We'll come back to the pigeons in a moment. And the money changers sitting there. Now I just want you to first get the scene in your mind. They are at the temple. This is the second temple. This is the temple that Herod famously built. It was a wonder of the world. It was absolutely massive. Here's an artistic depiction of it. And all of the activity that we're going to read about today in John chapter 2, second part of John 2, happens in the court of the Gentiles, which is this outer court here and this court here. There's a little bit of a better view of it if you look at it from the top. So the temple proper is in the very middle there, and then you have the court of the Gentiles that is all surrounding the temple. And that's where this buying and selling was taking place. Note that Jesus talks about the animals that were there. And we know if you were here for our Altered Lives series that, that sacrificing an animal was a distinct part of coming to worship. It was a, it was a part of bringing a, an offering to God that allowed people to engage his presence. So why does Jesus overturn the tables? Why does he rage against this religious machine? Well, just think about it. If you were traveling to Jerusalem from, let's say, 30 miles away, and you started on your journey with your lamb without blemish to bring and to offer in the temple. After walking 30 miles, would your lamb be without blemish still? Most likely not. And so your lamb is lim limping in. <laughs> and the priest is like, that does not look like a lamb without blemish. And you're like, well, it was when we left Nazareth. Thank you very much. He's had a hard journey, right? And then someone would come out of the shadows and say, I see that your lamb is a lamb without blemish. I have a lamb that is, is actually without blemish. I'm willing to sell this lamb to you. But you're a bit of a captive audience at that point, are you not? How many of you have bought food at Disneyland lately? <laughs> or, or how many of you have been to a Padres game and you went and you bought a hamburger and it cost $25 and you looked at the burger and then you looked at how bad they're hitting the ball and you said, this ought not be, right? <laughs> Anybody? Right, so why at Disneyland? Why can they charge so much money for food? Why at a Padres game can they charge you so much money for food? Because you don't have other options. When people walked into the temple and they saw people selling, the prices were jacked up because you had no other options. Where, you weren't going to call for a takeout lamb. It just wasn't going to happen. It's why in Matthew's account of this, Jesus will look at the people who are buying and selling and he will say to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of robbers. You're stealing from people. Not only that, but you are manipulating people whose good intentions have caused them to go on this spiritual pilgrim journey to come to the temple, and then you are manipulating them and taking advantage of them. They're on a spiritual journey, and they're being manipulated, and Jesus looks at that, and he flips over the table, and he goes, not on my watch. Not on my watch. And, and, and there's this sense of the way that worship has to overturn or flip over manipulation. That Jesus was helping people get back to the reason that they had come to the temple in the first place. And the reason they came was to worship God. The reason they came was to encounter the living God. And how terrible that people came to worship and they were manipulated, taken advantage of. Now, I think we just need to name maybe what's in the air, and that is that, unfortunately, religion and manipulation often go hand in hand. And um, it grieves the heart of God 
But we've seen it happen throughout the centuries. Maybe the most famous way that it happened was in the Roman church. Right before the Protestant Reformation, uh, there was a number of really savvy religious businessmen who went and who profited off of the selling of indulgences. One of their names was Johann Tetzel, and here's what he said. He said, this was his famous sales pitch. A coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. You give to me and your relatives who have passed away, well, they'll go to heaven. Hey, it may not um, surprise you. Tetzel did fairly well, raised a ton of money, and there was a wake of religious manipulation left in his path. Now, before we start throwing stones as evangelicals, let's just remember that we live in glass houses. Amen? All you need to do is go turn on the television and you can find somebody who is encouraging you to sow your seed. And if you sow your seed, certainly it will reap a harvest of a hundredfold. And by the way, they're flying in their G6 all around giving that message. It's working for one person. Them. Or if that's too much, you could just hop online and get your Jesus junk. You could get your Jesus is your homeboy t-shirt. You could get your Jesus is bobblehead doll. You can get all of it. And people come longing to worship. And what happens? They They get taken advantage of. And what we see here is Jesus hates it. He hates it. The story goes on. Verse 15. And making a whip of cords, we'll come back to that in a moment, he drove them out of the temple with the sheep and oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. I mean, can you imagine this scene? The temple courts are just packed to the gills, and Jesus overturns, has the audacity to overturn the tables. You could hear a pin drop in that place, and then somehow he drives everybody and every animal out of that space. This is Alpha Jesus to the max. And he told those who sold the pigeons. So, so like out of all the people selling things, these people are like raising birds. They're like, <laughs> and Jesus is like you with the bird. Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. So so Jesus, like, in a very general way, rages against the religious machine. But then he, like, goes after the birds. It seems like in a very personal way. And don't you just want to pause and be like, Jesus, like, why so much angst against the birds. Are you just an anti-birdite? Is, uh, what is going on? Well, the question becomes, why are the birds in the temple in the first place? Why were birds a sacrifice at all? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. <laughs> Leviticus chapter 5 verse 7 says, but if he cannot afford, everybody say cannot afford, cannot afford a lamb, then he shall bring to the Lord as his compensation for sin that he has committed two turtle doves or two? Ah, one for sin offering and the other for burnt offering. So the only reason somebody would bring a pigeon would be if they couldn't afford a lamb. So imagine a scene where people are coming into the temple You've traveled a long way. Maybe you've even saved your family's money in order to make this journey one time in your life because you are so poor. You get to the temple and all you can afford is a pigeon and the price of the pigeon is skyrocketed because they have a, quote, captive audience. And Jesus goes, you're, you're raising the price of pigeons too? That you're taking advantage of people that have, have little to nothing? 
and, and when he flips over that table, it's as though he says that justice needs to overturn exploitation. It needs to overturn exploitation. That the heart of God is distinctly for people who are destitute, who are under-resourced, who are poor. God has a tender spot in his heart for the poor. You have to know that. That, That's no political agenda. That's the heart of our God. Listen to the way that Proverbs would put it. Whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker, but he who is generous to the needy honors him. And he's going, listen, I'm being insulted in my own house. You're taking advantage of the poor in my own house. And God says, I hate it. My people are to be a people of justice. They are supposed to rage against the machine of injustice, not participate with it. The provision of pigeons was designed to create space for the poor. And now that space is being capitalized on. And Jesus goes, not on my watch. No way. I, I, um, I love that that we are a church that has consistently over our history said we want to be a church that comes alongside those who are under-resourced. It's why we support interfaith in our community. It's the reason that we hold out hope and resources to refugees who get relocated into our general area. It's the reason that we try to come alongside orphans and widows. It's, it's because it's God's heart. It's because it's God's heart. And I just wonder if there's any sort of pretense in our own life of maybe better than or if they'd only pull up their own bootstraps in our own heart that Jesus just wants to come up to today and go, no, no, justice. That's his heartbeat. So Jesus makes a whip. (laughs) And, And it's interesting to me that Jesus doesn't bring a whip, he makes a whip. Like all of this is just bubbling up in real time. He's not like, you know what I should do? I should make a whip go into the temple courts, and then go Indiana Jones on them. Like, that's not the case. Which begs the question, if you're in the temple court, what do you make a whip out of? (laughs) Like, maybe there was some cords around there that he could have used. I've often imagined that it's like a reed that had grown up, and maybe Jesus, like, weaves those together, but you couldn't find that in the temple court. So if you're in the temple court, what do you use to make a whip? And then I went, read this one rabbi, and I was like, that changes everything. One of these rabbis said, the way that Jesus made a whip out of cords was he used the cords that were attached to his robe as a rabbi. And the cords that were attached to his robe as a rabbi rabbi, were white and blue intertwined together and they were symbolic of the covenant and covenantal purity that God had called his people to live with. So imagine Jesus taking off the cords from his robe, making a whip out of them, and then just Indiana Jonesing those cords, it makes a statement. I mean, it would be like him taking a Bible and going, no! This, what you're doing in the temple, has absolutely nothing to do with this. That's what he's saying. He's going somewhere along the way we got off track. Somewhere along the way we stopped abiding with scripture and we started bowing to the traditions of men. Somewhere along the way this became about economics rather than worship. Somewhere along the way compassion started to get overturned with the traditions of the people. And he flips that table and he goes, no, no. It's not about tradition. It's not about preserving tradition. It's not about the way that they had baptized the marketplace and brought it into the space of God. It was about the heart of God that they were missing. And so when Jesus makes this whip, I I tend to think that he did make the whip out of cords from his own robe. And I think it was his way of saying, yeah, yeah, you may have been in this booth for a few years, And maybe you're even a second generation merchant in the temple courts. But you're far from the heart of God. And the traditions that you have made are actually creating barriers to people coming to worship.
ouch, that helps. They'd forgotten or maybe conveniently ignored the words of Hosea, God's words, for I desire steadfast love and not, what? Sacrifice. The knowledge of God rather than what? Burnt offerings. Those were, those were words that Jesus would repeat when he was talking to the Pharisees. People were flocking to him, people that, that the religious elite thought shouldn't have any ability to get close to Jesus. And Jesus goes, you've, you've lost the plot. And when these people are raising the prices, manipulating and exploiting, he's saying, you've lost the plot. The plot was never about just going through the motions of sacrifice. And it surely wasn't about capitalizing on sacrifice. It's about steadfast love. It's about loving God. It's about coming to meet with God in the most sacred holy place that they could go and meet with him back then. I I just, I don't know about you, but I read through the scriptures and I just love the way that angsty Jesus pushes back on the traditions of men. I mean, we see him healing on the Sabbath. Could he have healed on the day before? Absolutely. He heals on the Sabbath just to poke at him and go, you know where you can't find that rule? In here. Uh, he, his disciples go through the fields and they rub their hands together and they create grain and they eat grain on the Sabbath. And the religious people are like, you're not allowed to do that on the Sabbath. And Jesus is like, show me. He had children that would just flock to him. And the tradition was, if you were an important rabbi, you didn't have time for kids. And Jesus says, let the little children come to me. (laughs) Their tradition was to wash their hands before they ate. Now, um, for uh, health purposes, I would recommend this, but that wasn't why they were doing it. They would wash their hands before they ate. And Jesus, people gave Jesus a hard time for his disciples not doing that. And he's like, that's a tradition of men. It's not a command of God. And time and time again, we see that Jesus didn't have a lot of respect for tradition, but he had immense reverence for scripture. And those two things are not the same. We love to baptize our traditions, but scripture and tradition are not the same. See, Jesus didn't break the law that God had established. He broke the extra rules that the religious leaders had put in place. (laughs) And that made a lot of people mad. But in Jesus' economy, what's best for people is always what's best. In Jesus' economy, what's best for people is always what's best. And this week, I've just been trying to sit with this question, and maybe, maybe it'll become like an earworm in year two. Like, what, what are the traditions that, that I hold to that maybe say to people, you're not welcome in this space, or you've got to jump over these barriers in order to get into these space, or you've got to pony up if you're going to be a part? Those are the questions that have just been stirring in me. Verse 17, it says, his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The disciples knew their scripture to some extent. And so they knew, okay, Jesus is living out. He's embodying Psalm 69. That's what's going on. And if you go and read through Psalm 69, what you'll see is that it's written by a person who's in immense distress, whose uh, enemies are crowding out all around them. And in the midst of all of it, they're crying out to God and they're saying, God, I will continue to maintain a zeal for your house, even though your people and others are crowding in around me. Zeal. Um, In in the Greek, that word zeal comes from the word to boil. Boil. So it has this picture, sort of an onomatopoeia. It's a picture of water that's boiling and maybe even boiling to the point of overflowing. It it means jealousy. It means anger. Did you know that Jesus is zealous? Did you know that? He's zealous. And what's he zealous for? 
Well, in this text, he's zealous for the purity of his father's house because it's in that space that people get to encounter God. He is passionate, zealous that people would unencumbered be able to come and worship Yahweh. That's what he's zealous for. He's zealous for Psalm 27 for being lived out. David wrote this. He said, one thing I've asked the Lord that I will seek after. What's that one thing, David? Please tell us. He says, I will. That I may dwell in the, what? House of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in, what? His temple. He goes, listen, I, I long to come into the house of God and I just, I just want to seek him. I just want to, I just want to gaze upon his beauty. I just want to have a conversation with him where I can hear his voice and, and he can direct my life. And, and what Jesus does when he flips over the tables is he goes, yeah, that, that's the heart of it. That's what we've got to get back to. Not buy and sell, but come and see, come and gaze, come and worship, come and pour your heart out to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And big business got in the way of the journey to meet with God. And when Jesus flips over that table, he goes, no, 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 no. This is not about commodity. This is about intimacy. This isn't about running a business. This is about meeting with God. This isn't about turning a profit. It's about knowing a person. This whole idea of um, commodifying God, I think should cause us to just pause a little bit. Can we agree? It caused me to. And then I stumbled across this quote by Richard Halverson, who served as a chaplain to the United States Senate. Listen to what he said. He said, in the beginning, the church was a fellowship of men and women centered on the living Christ. Then the church moved to Greece, where it became a philosophy. Then it moved to Rome, where it became an institution. Next, it moved to Europe, where it became a culture. Finally, it moved to America, where it became an enterprise. Ouch. That helps. So here's my questions. These are just my questions I'm asking myself, and I'll invite you into my journey a little bit. Here are my questions. Are there ways that we turn it, God into a good or service to be enjoyed and to meet our needs? And one of my questions is how, how high do my preferences rank on my scale of what's important to me? And, and I get it, like in a digital world, like we could all go and we could like, uh, we could have recordings of our wor favorite worship bands and, and man, just our favorite songs and recordings. Like you could have four different worship bands as a part of your service and then like podcast your favorite preacher and listen to him on two times, of course. Um, and, um, and I mean, we can do this, right? Like we can commodify God pretty easily. Uh, do we come to meet with the living God or we, do we come to get our religious hustle on? Do we come, come to become a living sacrifice or, or do we come to purchase one? Like, are we here today because we want to meet with a living Jesus or do we just want to check a box? Are we hustling religion like we hustle everything else in our lives? Like let's just add it to our Amazon subscriptions list so we can put it out of our mind and know that it takes care of itself. And then I started to think just, just about me. And I'm like, gosh, Lord, is the house of my mind a house of prayer or is it a marketplace? Are, are my affections being bought and sold? Is my mind like, like a mall that's just constantly going? Or can I actually slow down and be with Jesus? Am I like an emporium? the internal workings of my life like an emporium or am I a place of communion? See, Jesus flips tables because he longs for intimacy. That's why he created us. And see, Jesus flips the tables because he wants your heart off the market. He's going, no, that's not what it's about. It's about coming to me. It's not about jumping through all the hoops. It's about encountering me, the living 
God. It's interesting that um, sometimes we don't understand Jesus when we listen to him directly, but we understand him better when we listen to the people around him reacting to him. So listen to the way that the people around Jesus react. They, they say to him, um, hey, man, you're going to have to show us a sign for why you're doing all this. Like, like what, what gives you the right to make a stop to the sacrificial system that our economy and religion is built around? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. And the Jews said to him, that it's taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? Oh, come on. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. And notice that Jesus equates standing in the shadow of that massive temple. He says, the true temple, the real temple, it's not that building that took you over four decades to build. It's actually this person. And John has already put down the breadcrumbs for this for us in John chapter 1 verse 14, where he said that Jesus put on flesh and tabernacled among us. Now Jesus is standing in front of the tabernacle, in front of the temple, and he's going, I'm the new temple. I'm the ultimate tabernacle. See, you guys, you have to get this, that the, the, the temple was the heart of Judaism. It was a place where people met with God. It was a place where people gathered as a community. It was a place where people experienced forgiveness. It was a place where the glory of God dwelt. And Jesus stands in front of the temple and goes, it's not about that. It's about me. He's the new place where forgiveness is found. He's the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world through free grace not through purchased sacrifices. He's the place where the glory of God dwells in all of its fullness, not accessed through the traditions of men, but through purity of heart. The pure in heart shall see God. He's the new way to holiness, not through the blood of goats and bulls and pigeons, but through his own shed blood for us on the cross. Jesus is claiming that God is doing something definitively new and different, and the temple becomes redundant based on who he is and what he's going to do. And those kinds of words can get you killed. So listen to John's narrative note. He says, when therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word Jesus had spoken. They, they only believe after he's raised from the dead that what he said there would actually take place. Like, like, like really capture that, hold on to it. After Jesus dies and raises from the dead, the disciples are going back through all the things that Jesus did and said and going, oh, oh, oh. Do you remember when? He was standing at the temple. He pointed at the temple. He said, raise this temple up in three days. And he was talking about himself and and then the ripple effects of that conviction. See, the resurrection of Jesus validated everything that Jesus did and taught. Everything that Jesus did and taught. And I started to wonder, how much poorer would we be if the disciples hadn't gone back and rethought everything in light of the resurrection. How much poor would we be if they weren't willing to let go of tradition and religion to pursue Jesus? Like those, maybe those systems would even still be at work in some way. Maybe they still are at work some ways in us. See, I think that we as God's people need to constantly be discerning how the risen Christ through his spirit is at work in our midst. And I think we need to be willing to let go of our traditions in order to follow the promptings and movements of his spirit, to stay in step with his spirit. What they go back and do, we must be doing as well. So maybe we ask him afresh, what tables do you want to overturn? And me, and me, 
Here's the way this passage ends. It says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. So Jesus is making a bit of a cryptic statement here, but here's what I I think he's saying. I think he's saying that what caused the system of the temple to develop in the first place, manipulation, exploitation, the system that they were creating, the traditions, lack of compassion. I think what he's saying is those things exist in all of us. Like it's easy to point and go, gosh, they really screwed it up. Wow, how could they have gotten so far from the heart of God? But here Jesus just drops his gauntlet and goes, nah, you don't get off that easy. It's in all of us. It's in all of us on some level, maybe even in the best of us. Over a century ago, there's a a struggling follower of Jesus. He struggled with a number of mental health issues. Um, at, At one point, he cut off his own ear and eventually he took his own life. He was also a brilliant artist. You may have heard of him. His name is Vincent Van Gogh. Vincent Van Gogh was a follower of Jesus who had just grown so disenfranchised with the institutional church. At at one point in his life, he was so sold out that he said, I'm going to go and I'm going to serve as a missionary. At another point later on in his life, he said, the God of the clergymen, he is for me as dead as a doornail. And he called himself no friend of present day Christianity. What's fascinating about Van Gogh is that in his paintings, you see a man who's just wrestling with his faith, who who felt like he needed to go outside of the church in order to encounter the living God. And actually, his most famous painting is distinctly about that. See, Starry Night is Van Gogh's depiction of a little French village with divine light shining all around. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. But if you go and you look at this painting in depth, here's what you'll find. In every single one of the buildings, there's light on. Except for one. Let me zoom in to help you. The church is the only dark building under this landscape of divine starry light. And Van Gogh Gogh is saying, gosh, the church has has grown silent. The church has has grown cold. And, And I think his angst was the church is doing, it seems like everything it can to keep me from Jesus instead of welcoming me to Jesus. So many barriers. But maybe that's not entirely the way that we sit today. Maybe it's more like um, Ron Ron English's parody of this painting, which is called Starry Night Urban Sprawl. And instead of the church being cold and dead without lights, it's adorned with the McDonald's arches and King Kong climbing on it. A a picture of entertainment and enterprise. And I think all of that, I don't know about you, but but like I I have these two pictures in my head and my heart. And I think both of those are pictures of churches that Jesus wants to flip the tables over in and go, no, 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 there's more. There's more. It's not about manipulation. It's about worship. I think he wants to just look at us and say, no, 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 it's not about exploitation. It's about justice, God's heart for the poor. It's not, it is not about preserving tradition. It is about getting to the compassion that God has for every single person who walks through these doors and who walks the streets of Escondido and North County and to the ends of the earth. And if we got to let go of a few of our traditions in order to reach people and love people, you guys, we've got to be willing to do it. We've got to be willing to do it. 
I don't know, I'm just, I'm, I'm a little bit haunted by both of those pictures of churches because I so desperately want the heart of Jesus. And when he says he's the new temple, I think what he's saying to us is you've got to allow my sacrifice to become your holiness, not your traditions and not jumping through the hoops. My sacrifice to become your holiness and my presence to become your passion. So so maybe we're not as far away from Jesus turning over our tables as we wish we were. Like that's, that's the conclusion I came to. And as we read the story about this cleansing of this temple, I think we see the way that religion so often complicates, commodifies, and corrupts what God originally intended. But Jesus rages against that machine and he rages against the machines that we create that keep us and others from God. So today let's invite him to rage against that machine. Let's invite us him to overturn those tables because in overturning the tables in the temple, what Jesus does is he creates an opportunity for everybody to find their seat at the banquet of God, free by grace. And I don't know about you, but I want us to shine. I want to shine like a city on a hill, like a light that cannot be hidden, not with McDonald arches, but with the cross of the crucified Messiah who says, if you're thirsty, come and drink. If you're hungry, come and eat. Come and find streams of living water, bread of life in him. And let's do our best to clear out everything that creates a barrier in between us and others coming to Jesus. Let's ask him to turn over the tables in our hearts. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray. So would you just ask him even right now, Lord, what, what tables do you want to overturn? Tables of pride, tables of power, of preference, tables of having to be right, get ours. Just ask him, would you? Jesus, what tables do you want to overturn in me? So Lord, we come before you today longing to meet with you, not to manipulate you, not to try to exploit you, not to preserve any traditions. Lord, we just want your heart, your compassion towards us that's free of charge. God, may we receive that in such a way that it would be what flows out of every pore of our being. Thank you for being the kind of God that confronts corruption in order to lead us to freedom and the things that are bent and the things that are broken in us. Would you confront those so that we might experience you and live in your freedom more fully, we pray. In Jesus' name.